During 2023, this channel had tens of thousands of new subscribers. And so I'm aware that there's a lot of new folk watching this channel who have all sorts of questions about climbing. And so I thought it was about time that I did a few episodes based on your questions. Inevitably, we're going to cover some controversial territory and I am about to jump in right at the deep end. <laughs> but I do like to feel that on this channel, I want to have a bit of courage to answer any question that you have, even if it's just to say that I don't really know the answer. A big goal of this channel is to encourage climbers to think in a different way about their own climbing and ask the right questions. And that was a big goal of my book, 9 out of 10 Climbers Make the Same Mistakes. And that's why this became kind of almost like a viral book, really. And thousands of you tell me regularly that you go back and reread it to challenge yourself and identify ruts that you're getting into or ways of thinking about climbing that are holding you back. And that's brilliant. And, you know, that constant challenge to your ideas is the way forward for breaking through plateaus in your climbing. So let's start with 9 out of 10 for the first question. And, you know, I'm really grateful to those of you who support me on Patreon, and I'll link below if you want to support my work. So I asked my Patreon supporters to ask me anything, and here was one of the first. So Nate asks, if you made a second edition of 9 out of 10, what would you revise? <laughs> I'd be fairly certain that the nutrition information may be updated or qualified. I'd be most interested if you have changed your thoughts drastically on any of the training or outdoor climbing aspects. Nate, you're on the money with your comment about the nutrition section. <laughs> I would update it and qualify it. I would qualify my comments about carbohydrate intake for climbers or athletes in general to say that they are only relevant to those athletes who choose to eat a high carbohydrate diet. To boil it down to a simple idea, if you choose carbs as your primary energy source, then you need to keep eating carbs regularly. And you may, if you do that, need to do things like snacking during your training sessions or on a day out at the crag to avoid dips in energy. And you might feel that you're you have fluctuations in your energy levels if you don't keep up with that regularly. If, on the other hand, you adapt to a very low carb diet for an extended period of time, then all bets are off. <laughs> the amount of carbohydrate that is needed for the same training, even of high intensity, such as bouldering or hard endurance intervals, is going to be much less. And obviously, you'll need to be eating fat instead, but you might need to eat meals less frequently. And so those mid-training or mid-climbing snacks become less of a critical part of your routine in order to avoid performance dips. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. Not everyone needs or wants to eat either a high or low carb diet. <laughs> and we now have studies showing that athletes can do pretty well on either. But importantly, when I say that, I mean some athletes. That doesn't necessarily mean any athlete. It doesn't necessarily mean you. You know, I spent most of my athletic career trying to do well on a high carb diet and it was inferior to the approach that I now take. People have various reasons for wanting to pursue either approach and they may or may not be able to make it work for a multitude of reasons. I'm sure you already know that I made an incredibly detailed video on this, which is more like a video course. And for those of you who haven't seen that, it's free and I'll, I'll link to it just there. I'd also qualify my comments about balance and moderation in diet. Like the comments I just made about low and high carb diets, balance and moderation are concepts that are really conditionally relevant. They were concepts that were developed under the paradigm of the mostly plant-based diets that the modern world follows, where the bulk of our food energy and weight comes from grains and fruits and vegetables in various forms. And in general, those foods have an inconsistent and often incomplete nutritional profile. They lack some vitamins, some minerals, or some key amino acids in the protein. So you have to hedge your bets and you have to spread your intake across a range of foods so that you don't get too much of one and end up with a deficiency or too little of a particular nutrient and end up with a deficiency. <laughs> also, a constant issue is the fact that whole plant foods tend to have either a lot of calories or fiber per unit nutrient. And so you can't eat too much fiber or it gets irritating or in some cases even damaging to the gut. And also you don't want to end up overeating calories to get an adequate 
amount of nutrients for obvious reasons. By contrast, when it comes to the animal sourced foods, it's a bit of a different picture. So if you're basing your diet on beef and eggs and salmon and you're eating larger amounts of those every day, and I'm talking like, you know, five to eight eggs and a kilo of beef, then the idea of balance and moderation become solutions to a problem that you don't really have. You know, they're kind of redundant. And this is one of the appeals of an animal based diet that I've spoken about before on this channel. And you know, you, you might like balance and variety and moderation and not want to give it up, and that's totally fine. Assuming your nutritional strategy is giving you the results that you're looking for. <laughs> so when I wrote 9 out of 10 climbers, I assumed mistakenly that optimizing a varied diet based on mostly fruits and vegetables and grains was the best that was on offer. But that strategy was not giving me optimal results, and I think I'm not alone in that. And so the revision that I would write would offer alternative strategies as well that might be relevant to a subset of climbers. <laughs> okay, so I guess I went completely off on the first part of your question about nutrition. What about training in general? Well, there are a few things that I would revise, but really not a lot. And, you know, contrary to my expectations, I think the book in general, the content that's actually in there, is more relevant now with the way that climbing and climbing media has changed than it was when I actually wrote it. And I'll explore that in more depth in a dedicated episode, maybe. But the general point is this. Nine out of ten try to plant a structure of simple principles and priorities that will always be important and you could use to judge individual training decisions. And these days when you watch the free climbing media on YouTube and other platforms, it's increasingly skewed by the need to stand out by presenting something new and exciting. And the fitness world has always kind of been like that to an extent. You know, a lot of new trends in training or fitness are actually on their second or third round of being on trend since like the 1970s. <laughs> the difference now is the volume of it. And when you're swimming in this sea of content that people are putting out about training, then it's really more important than ever not to lose sight of the basics that are never going to change. And that's, I think, the, was the value of this book. And I think it's still really important now. The funny thing is, I thought that after it had been out for about five years, all the ideas in this book would be obvious to basically all climbers as more and more training knowledge got out there. And the irony is that's actually not the case. And when I wa watch a lot of training content on YouTube, there's a lot of it that's brilliant, but there's some of it that I flatly disagree with and I think it actually sends climbers backwards. Thankfully, there are some really experienced and knowledgeable voices out there in climbing training. And let me just, I'll just pick one example. Last week, uh, I was driving to the crag and I was listening to Martin Keller speaking on a podcast and that guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> there are even some things that I might not totally overlap with Martin on, but people like him have a lot of experience and are just brilliant and it's great to have access to them and our sport is really better for people like that. Okay, I think that'll do for that question. <laughs> so Aaron asks... In your first Nugget podcast, you said that over the years, you've gradually improved the efficiency of your research and organization of scientific material you digest. I think you also said that you have 2000 plus papers organized in your Evernote. And I'd love to hear more about your system, although I realize this is kind of tangential to climbing. Yeah, that's true. I did actually start to get things more organized uh, really as I started to study nutrition back around 2015. Nutrition is this kind of spidery scientific discipline and it forces you down all these different lanes of science and the number of papers that you have to read just explodes exponentially. So when you read one paper and that immediately links you to 10 more that you have to then go and read and try and keep track of, you know, so you're in epidemiology, biochemistry, basic science, mechanistic studies, paleoanthropology, food systems, environmental science, <laughs> it just goes on and on. You know, occasionally you get a randomized controlled trial as well, but there's not so many of them. So I do log them properly in EndNote, and I use that for citing them in written work or scripts that I do for this channel or elsewhere. But I also have a kind of holding pattern for new studies, which unfortunately is getting a little bit out of hand now. Instead of scrolling on Instagram each day for maybe about 
an hour, I would say, I scroll new research. <laughs> so most days, and I do that on my phone, so most days I'll save at least one, but usually two or three interesting papers. And I save that onto my Apple Notes because that's just an easier way to do it on my phone. And then I'll bookmark them properly on EndNote later on. But I, I never seem to get time to do that. Right, I think I'll do one more question for this episode and then I'll tackle more in another installment. And if you find these interesting, then you're welcome to subscribe and also you're welcome to ask more questions in the comments. And since we've started on nutrition, I think maybe it makes sense to end on it in this episode as well. So here's Levi's question. Dave, I have dozens of small detail questions I think of asking you all the time, mostly diet and nutrition related as I'm in the process of figuring out my diet through some experiments. I have trouble with moderation on a mixed diet and with a stricter carnivore diet, I think I might have been underfueling as I didn't realize how much I needed to eat. Can you tell me a little bit more about your process of diet experiments, as in the highs and lows, the times when you had trouble with moderation in carbs? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm definitely in the trouble with moderation with carbs club. <laughs> I can tell you exactly when I had that trouble, which was from about 1992 when I hit puberty to about the present day. <laughs> The lows that I had with carbs, I would say were probably worse between about 2010 and 2015. And by that point I was in my, you know, in my thirties and my strategy of calorie control and intermittent restricting of calories to stop myself gaining excess fat was gradually starting to fail. But I still felt that I had to eat carbs because that was necessary for athletic performance. And I still saw this issue of weight and excess fat as an issue of amount of food and not as an issue of type of food. And today when I eat a high carb diet, I still struggle to moderate it. But it, there is a there is a difference, I would say, because now I know that there is an alternative that I can return to at any time. And I do return to it, which is the ketogenic diet. And that does make it easier uh, to kind of cope with, even if I revert to eating a high carb diet for whatever reason. So the issue that you describe with underfueling on a carnivore diet and also other ketogenic diets, it can be something to look out for, especially for athletic folk who are so conditioned to the notion that of calorie control, calorie deficits or surplus. By contrast, a lot of the discourse on keto diets online is geared towards people who've got like 50 or 100 pounds to lose and they're sedentary and maybe they've got type 2 diabetes. This is quite a different group of people and underfueling is maybe a lot less common in that group. I've certainly seen that myself in non-athletic friends and family who've tried the keto diet. They do tend to lose a lot of their excess weight but I've not seen any of them veer too far in the other direction and end up becoming too lean and underfueling. And for athletes, especially those who are getting towards disordered restriction of food intake and those who are already quite lean, they do really need to counsel themselves or, or be guided to retrain their feelings of satiety and realise that it's okay to be full <laughs> and to enjoy eating to satiety with no restraint. And if you've eaten, if you've eaten a, a high carb diet or, or any diet that's a, you know, made you struggle to stop gaining excess fat, then you might be very closely conditioned to think that you must always restrict food intake. And that's really the benefit of the ketogenic diet for me is to move away from that constant restriction of food intake. And I made this point in my own long video about the keto diet, but I think it's actually easy for people to skip past or not to take all that seriously. And so the bottom line here is that on a keto or carnivore diet, you may need to consciously listen for and go right to satiety when you eat a meal. And that, that may be more food than you were expecting. And I think that's especially true if you think that half a kilo of beef at one meal sounds like a lot. And it's really not, you know, five eggs is 300 calories. <laughs> Before I go, I'll mention one more high and low from the past two years. On my own carnivore diet experiments, I managed to put my lifelong eczema on, that's affected my feet into remission for the first time in 42 years. And honestly, I couldn't actually believe that that was even possible. And it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. It made a huge difference to my life. But after enjoying my pain-free feet for about a whole year, I did a whole foods plant-based diet experiment last March. And 
during that, the eczema came back and now I have been unable to get rid of it again. So I really wish that I hadn't done that. Okay, thanks again for your questions. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Please ask me some more questions. And if you enjoy these types of episodes, do let me know and do subscribe. See you in the next one.